Hi, this is Paula from CHNE. Today we're doing a panel discussion on municipal affairs. We'll be speaking with Inverness County CAO Keith McDonald, with Councillor Alfred Poirier for Shetty Camp, Pleasant Bay and Mid Cove, and with Councillor Lori Cranton for Margarita and St. Joseph. We'll be speaking about the latest council meeting from June 4th. Here's our conversation. I read the minutes, a presentation by Poirier. Uh, he talked about the Shirikam Ground and Search Rescue. Um, can you tell me more about that? Can we start with Keith? Certainly, there's a number of uh, search and rescue organizations that have uh, jurisdiction in Everness County. Um, but we're really trying to get a handle of that, which groups are responsible for what particular areas and how are they gonna cooperate in the future. And this is the first time um, in some time, uh, maybe ever, that we've heard from uh, the Shetty Camp group. And they've explained where their coverage area is and the resources they have currently. Uh, right now, the municipality does provide $5,000 for the straight area search and rescue uh, organization. So um, the Shetty Camp group is looking to be considered to receive some funding as well. and. But right now, and, and that's being certainly considered in a positive light, uh, but the municipality is hoping to connect with all the various search and rescue groups in the very near future to find out all of their needs and make sure we have a really uh, organized approach to search and rescue efforts for all of the uh, county. So we wanna make sure every area is covered and we know who's responsible for which uh, portions of the municipality. Uh, so we hope to get that all straightened out over the next uh, uh, few months. In the presentation, what are some of the needs, well, all of the needs for the Shetty Camp Ground and Rescue? Uh, uh, well, they do a great job. Uh, the counselor can get into that a little bit more. Um, but certainly uh, they have equipment and uh, some infrastructure that they need to maintain, as well as the costs associated to every time they go out for a search. And they have very limited revenue to offset those costs. Uh, so that's why they've uh, come to the municipality for uh, consideration for some additional funds so that they, uh, they can really focus on growing their volunteer base and having good processes uh, when it comes to the rescues that they have to uh, uh, um, put together with uh, their volunteers. If I might add, I, I feel that, uh, you know, like the search and camp search and rescue has been uh, in operation for a good number of years and they serve the community and outside the community, everywhere across the island and even on the mainland. Uh, the biggest problem is like any or local or any organization now, volunteer is hard enough to get you know, to do the work. Plus, if you have to do all the fundraising in order to keep operating and uh, so it gets a, a burden. And like, like I said, it's not like it used to be 10, 20, 25 years ago. So that, their main concern was that, uh, you know, we are providing the service with a very top-notch uh, search and rescue team. We have three instructors, I don't know exactly, they're, they have different names for different uh, role in their uh, function, but uh, it is one opportunity for them to go and check it out to see how it can be spread out in a little bit, you know, fairer for them because mostly all the money is coming from local and we are they are going all across so it's just a matter of uh, trying to get to reorganize and uh, have a good look at uh, the fund not the fundraising but how they can be uh, worked out without be having any major fundraising and uh, so on top of this i know uh, we have uh, they, they've been called many many times all across like i said before uh, next, I wanted to ask about rezoning. Uh, there were in the minutes a description that somebody uh, asked for rezoning for three pieces of land. Can you tell me more about that? Keith? Yes, that was uh, that project was in the community of Inverness. Um, 
and there is a property uh, located in that community that the community wants to put together as a park and playground type of facility. And um, so they needed to have a change in the zoning requirements to make sure that occurred. Uh, so that was presented to council uh, by the Eastern District Planning Commission with a report um, that was already considered and then it went to a public hearing. So the results of the public hearing occurred just before the council meeting. We had some community members who, uh, who talked about the importance of this project and how it would help the community uh, go forward and provide recreation for young people. Uh, so council supported that request and, uh, and approved the zoning change. Okay, for three areas, I, th I think uh, three, three different uh, pieces of land would become one. Yes, there, well, there's three smaller parcels and uh, but it, that whole area would be considered now uh, able to have that type of development in that area. Uh, previous to that, the zoning requirements would not permit that type of activity. Okay. I wanted to move on to the October municipal election. Um, as I understand, there are some concerns still regarding the pandemic. Um, so I guess, uh, can we start with Lori? Sure. Um, yeah, there are some concerns within council. I think we're, you know, the province has decided to move forward with the election. So we all have to do that. I know our municipality is taking extra measures to make sure it's done in a safe and responsible way under the COVID-19 recommendations. Um, we are looking at uh, how people would enter the polls and exit the polls, um, accessibility to the polls, um, having the proper hand sanitizers and masks available, um, all that stuff that one would do to make sure that they meet the the uh, rules around um, the public and, and, and the pandemic. And uh, so I think uh, we have a really good returning officer who is working on that as well and setting up the polls. And uh, I think we're well on our way to uh, doing the voting part of it. Uh, some councillors, uh, I think, are a little concerned about how they will campaign if they need to during this uh, election where you won't be able to go out to home to home you're going to have to come up with other other means to do so and uh uh you know i use a wheelchair so it's i don't usually do that go, go home to home i usually use the phone a lot so not a lot will change for me but i know some counselors have really depend on going door to door and like to meet the the people face to face and at their home and uh and that's a concern, but everybody will be on the same same playing field with the same rules. So uh, hopefully, so hopefully it'll work out well. I don't know if Keith wants to add anything to that, or uh, the councilor covered it off very well at the last council meeting, that committee of the whole session. Uh, the chief or the returning officer, Derny Gillis, uh, he's he's handled a number of meetings or um, elections for the municipality in the past, so he's very experienced. But this is the first time he'll be looking at this type of situation and running an election. Um, many municipal units are looking at going full electronic voting. Um, some have a mix and there's a few that are just going with the traditional polls. Um, there's just a, um, some surveys sent out to various municipalities to find out their approach. And there's a good proportion of them moving forward with just uh, electronic but uh, Mr. Gillis is recommending uh, if the election date ma is maintained for this fall uh, that the municipality take a look at uh, uh, the option of electric or electric digital voting electronic voting uh, for the uh, for the advanced polls and then still have the availability of uh, traditional polling stations uh, on the day of the election but this hasn't been all finalized. It's in the still in discussion phase. Uh, we're, um, Mr. Gill is still looking at what other municipalities are doing. And, uh, and uh, the councilor is very correct in terms of all of the steps to maintain public safety are being uh, looked at very closely and a plan will be put in place 
uh, to protect uh, voters uh, while they uh, may be voting in this fall's election for the municipal election throughout Nova Scotia. <clears throat> And how does somebody uh, get on the list of voters if they're not already? Well, uh, Dern Gillis is he's responsible. We're working with the province to get that electoral list. Uh, the province does provide, does update that. Um, so we'll be, they just had an election in, in the very uh, uh, most very recent past. So that's going to be going to be the basis. And then uh, there'll be steps to update some of that and for people that may not be on that uh, list to contact uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, elections officers uh, to make sure that they're on the, on the list. And when does the campaigning begin? Campaigning can begin at any time. Um, right now we've already seen a number of um, municipal uh, or individuals running for municipal election throughout Nova Scotia that have stated that they're going to be running. Um, it may not be an official, it may not be an official campaign mode yet, but they've certainly announced that and made it public. And, um, but uh, uh, Mr. Gillis will have a deadline set for people to put in their submissions to be a candidate. Um, but individuals can decide at any point in time if they want to publicly announce that they'll be running and reach out to the public uh, in regards to uh, what their platform may or may not be. And how does somebody, uh, how can somebody who's interested in becoming a candidate, how can they submit their application? Well, they'll have to work through Mr. Gillis, the returning officer. Um, we're putting together a municipal website just or a municipal uh, a page on our municipal website just devoted to the election and information there. So that's certainly something that uh, that people have to reach out with uh, with uh, Mr. Gillis and schedule a time. Um, it would be advisable that they call him. Anyone interested in running should call him before um, before they're as early as possible just so that they know what uh, what steps they have to take place and we'll have that information on our website uh, fairly soon. Okay, I want to ask the councillors, Alfred, are you running again? Yeah, I will be running again and it will be my third term and uh, I, as far as the, the municipal election in October, I, I think uh, I'm pretty open to it, you know, because we all understand that uh, uh, it's a new way of doing things all across, but uh, my, my personal point of view here is myself, especially after two terms in council, is that uh, you are being, uh, uh, you are not really campaigning every day, but you are meeting people every day. You're doing the, you know, work for a certain organization, certain uh, individuals. And uh, so it's not as difficult to be known as if you're just coming in, you know, with uh, for your first time in. But uh, no, I'm all ready for it, you know, for my, hopefully it will be my last term if I do get elected. If the people feel that I have done uh, the work that they were expecting. Mind you, it's hard to get everything done and please everybody, but I'm here and running. And is the way that you campaign going to change? You were saying you meet with people a lot. Is that going to change in the context of the pandemic? Uh, no, it's not going to change at all. What I'll be doing is, uh, of course, I'll be doing what we're allowed to do, you know, uh, whether it is uh, knocking on doors, I'll knock on a few doors, but most of the people know me. Uh, phone call or I meet them on the, you know, uh, the, the co-op or at the store here, the dollar store we had. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it, I know all the people mostly that, uh, you know, for the good number of years. So it's not as if I was new coming to the game, you know, and uh, so I'll, like I said, I'll do what, whatever I'm allowed to do according to COVID-19. How about you, Lori? Are you running again? Yes, I am. This will be my second term. Uh, the last four years have certainly been an experience in terms of the learning curve for municipal government. 
Um, and uh, I think I've gotten that all under my belt now and uh, have a much broader understanding and many more contacts and have networked with many people across the board. So uh, I'm looking forward to another term if I can get there. And uh, I'll be basically doing similar to Councillor uh, Poirier or Deputy Warden Poirier in terms of you know, we'll have rules that we all have to follow, and I will follow them the same as everybody else. Um, I never was able to campaign door to door, so that's not a big change for me. Although I did do some community hall meetings last time and stuff that I may or may not be able, probably not be able to do this time because you probably won't be able to organize a crowd or a group of people. But I, I think I've worked with pretty well every organization within my various communities in my district or, or most of them and and have done that in a positive way so uh, the networking that happens through that process I think is very valuable um, because you don't meet one or two people you meet the whole organization and that word spreads from that if you do a good job that's going to spread if you do a bad job they're going to hear about that too so you you try to serve them the best you can within the rules of the municipality and and uh, I'm uh, so I'm looking forward to it. And uh, and uh, things have been so busy lately that uh, there hasn't been a lot of time for actual campaigning at this point. It's but I am still out there, like like uh, Deputy Warden Boyer said, you're out there working with people every day and uh, organizations every day. And that uh, that uh, all 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 is basically putting you in contact with people and people's needs and trying to help your communities um, be, a, be better places. And, uh, and it's not just your own district and community, it's the whole municipality as well. You have to take a holistic approach there. Um, sometimes we're working on an issue that has to do with everybody in the municipality and you may not see it locally as much and may have more relevance in another area, but very important to the municipality. So there's a lot of that work was on too, and you want to pass that on to your your constituents. So yes, I will be there, and and very happy to put my name forward. I wanted to move on to the budget. Um, as I saw on the, on the minutes for the meeting, uh, Keith, you gave uh, some highlights of what's going to be in the operational budget for 2020 and 2021. Can you tell me more? Certainly, uh, we've uh, we've. Went through a very detailed budget process um, and brought that to council again for discussion. We had some pre meetings, certainly, as a build up to this uh, presentation to the committee of the whole, uh, or I mean, to the regular council meeting. So uh, basically, we're, we're looking at a balanced budget this year, uh, just over $17 million, uh, with no increases in terms of taxes and other service charges uh, through the municipal unit. Uh, it was a very difficult budget to put together in terms of forecasting revenue. Um, the majority of the revenue, just close to 90%, approximately 90% is for, through taxpayers. Um, so that's in this current situation with COVID-19, um, we have to take a lot of considerations in terms of um, when people are gonna be able to pay their taxes and such. On top of that, some additional revenue that the municipality uh, relies upon, or uh, we, we just have to estimate a little bit more in, um, just based on the current situation. But uh, even in the light of the, the new pressures put on the municipality in terms of the pandemic and all of our pressures to um, modernize the organization and on top of that uh, to uh, continue to advance our repairs and replacement on our water and wastewater infrastructure and provide uh, good services to, to the residents. Uh, we've been able to work with council uh, on a balanced budget that does not have any uh, new tax increases. So uh, we're gonna have that all that information online for individuals to review so they can go into it uh, a little bit more closely. And just to note, one other challenge is that the municipality, we have some costs that 
we incur on an annual basis that we have no control over the uh, those budgets. So we have some mandatory um, costs that we have to pay out, um, in particular to the Department of Education, as well as to the uh, our RCMP services. So that takes up a great bulk of our budget. And a lot of residents don't realize the amount of funds that their, their residential taxes go towards uh, policing costs and education. So we have to make sure that residents uh, are informed about that a little bit, well, more, uh, certainly, um, because it is, it is a very significant portion of the budget. So the municipality can't devote that to any other services and it just flows through to these other units. There's additional costs as well that are mandatory, but those are the two big items. We're talking multi-million dollar contributions. Um, so it's that price for those services that we have to pay uh, flow through that they increase on an annual basis as well. So um, it does put a creates a difficult situation for the municipality where such a significant portion of the budget is immediately moved on to, uh, to police service education and other mandatory costs. So the budget presentation clearly outlined what those are and how those prices have increased uh, over the near term. Um, so we do hear obviously from residents like what do my taxes go towards and uh, and a lot of people are just not aware of how much of the residential taxes flow through to the province or other entities. So we have to educate people more on that so they, they have that understanding. And in terms of numbers, how much of it goes to the RCMP and then to education? Well, our mandatory costs are, are if you add all that together, it's over 30%. And, um, and we have a really good breakdown on that presentation that's that's uh, uh, they'll be online, and if you'd like to actually have a session just on the budget and go through those numbers, uh, we could we can certainly do that. It would it's it's a quite a detailed uh, budget, so I'm sure you'd have quite a few questions, and uh, we can advance that to you, and and we'll, and we'd be more than happy as staff and counselors to uh, to go through the budget. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when will we be ready online? Uh, we're just again we're revamping a number of the web uh, sites or the web pages within the site. Uh, we it should be up there for sure by next week. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I guess we'll go into more detail in a in a different video. But uh, I wanted to just quickly ask the counselors. Um, so would you know Alfred? Uh, can you name a few of the projects that will go to your district? Basically, for the budget itself. You know, it's been uh, it's it's generalized budget. You know that will be uh, presented. You know with uh, what we'll be doing, but at the same time we have uh, work that is being done that is uh, not being done worked on by the staff and I mean, that uh, you know I don't I can't disclose now due to the fact that it's not passed by the council and uh, etc. But uh, let me tell you, uh, I think uh, as far as uh, uh, what is coming to our uh, community or district one is basically the same like it should be discussed in the budget later on because it would take too long today. But the point is, is that uh, if we have, uh, you know, an organization uh, in my area as a, you know, a good project that they could bring in and everything and this can be discussed pretty well anytime during the year and it would be looked at you know and uh, with different avenue which the province a co-op and uh, part of the municipality so it is a broader you know it's not a yes project right now but uh, in the future you know we're looking at the basic needs of all the communities right now Lori, we were talking about the budget. Uh, w could you give me a general idea of some of the um, uh, projects that are going to your district, uh, money for projects in your district? Well, projects are an ongoing thing. 
Um, there's projects now that are going ongoing from the last budget, um, like uh, a new roof on our salmon museum here uh, is being added, and we've we've put some funding into that. Um, a road to the Belcoat uh, Wharf um, is being cost shared between the municipality. Uh, it was just repaved a couple of days ago. Badly needed. Um, and it's being cost shared by, between ourselves, the Harbor Authority and Small Craft Harbors. So that's a really big one for the local people and fishermen there and, and people that access the beach there as well. Um, and sometimes we look for other funding. We, in, a, in our projects, we have a, a coordinator, that, that uh, Melanie Beaton, who does a terrific job in looking at other sources of funding outside our municipal dollars that we bring to projects as well. And that's a big help. Um, in the foreseeable future, um, uh, I have a, an application I'm working on with a seniors group that is struggling a bit right now due to the COVID pandemic. Um, and uh, it's, it's an ongoing thing. So uh, the other thing that happens in our budget, every councillor is given a small allowance, and I'm, I'm talking a small allowance in today's world, but allows us to um, cost share some small projects with community groups um, in our in our various districts. Um, it has, still has to be approved by council, but uh, that uh, that um, that money can be used. Uh, so if groups want to contact their councillor, myself, in my district, um, and if they have a project of mine, it's something we can certainly take a look at. We can't fund everything, and there's not a lot of money, and it's we have to spread it between all the groups over the entire year, so we're we're pretty careful of how that, uh, which we should be, of how that gets gets distributed. But uh, it is a really good tool for us to be able to participate with groups with small projects that uh, need a little bit of help here and there to to get the projects off the ground, and then using that with Melanie's expertise, I think. Uh, has been a uh, has been real positive in terms of they have somebody with that understanding of project development and 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 uh, you know and partnering and, and obtaining funding to help them through the works as well. How much is that allowance? Um, it's around twenty. It's twenty thousand dollars. So it doesn't go very far when you have a whole district. And uh, it's divided into a couple of categories as well there, um, but it uh, it does does help councillors um, do some things within their own dis districts that are that are certainly um, positive. And again, I, I must reiterate, all those projects need the approval of council. I just can't go out and spend that money on what I like. It has to have the the, the go-ahead of council before it goes anywhere. I wanted to move on to the uh, the small options home. Uh, as I understand, the municipality uh, sent a letter because there were some frontline care workers who were left out of the program, the top up program for the federal. Actually, it was the federal government, right? Um, can you tell me more about that? Uh, what workers were excluded from that program? Uh, so the municipality, we have a. Um, um, Everness County uh, Homes Corporation that includes uh, the uh, Foyer Perfiset and Inverness Manor and two small option homes. So um, the, pro the federal government announced a program to support uh, some additional funds to frontline workers and that was negotiated with each of the individual uh, provinces uh, when it was first announced for the province of Nova Scotia. Um, it did not seem that workers that work in these uh, types of facilities were included in that frontline workers uh, category. The province has since made some changes to that. So the, the letter is just asking for some clarification in regards to uh, what individuals in Nova Scotia are eligible for this program. So we're hoping to get some more information regarding that and share that with uh, uh, the various, the two small option home employee or uh, or uh, the two small option homes that the municipality uh, is responsible for through the homes corporation 
I'm sorry, has that been changed or not yet? Uh, we've heard that it has changed. We're looking for the information, uh, but we that's the letter is just asking for more detailed outline of which, uh, which frontline staff will be qualified. And then uh, we'll follow up with that if these individuals are, are still not uh, within that, the, the categories of the frontline workers. So we're really looking for just some more detailed information from the province on that right now. There's something that I forgot to ask before uh, regarding the election. Uh, your, there's jobs that are going to open up for the election, right? How many positions are you looking at? Well, that's yet to be fully determined. Uh, the, our returning officer, again, is going through and looking at all the polling stations and then with uh, the pandemic, how many more individuals. So, um, you know, we're, we're, there's a good amount of people that will have an opportunity to work for that day of the election and uh, probably some hours the day before and getting things set up. And then there's a day of training. Uh, but all that uh, will, will be worked through in the next number of months and and uh, the returning officer is responsible for getting all those staff in place. So uh, as mentioned, we're gonna be looking at, very soon we'll have a, uh, a web page on our site just dedicated to the election and there'll be some information on that as well. And if I could just add to that, uh... Once the date is finalized for declaring to run in the election, there may be some districts as well that don't require election because the person there could go in by acclamation. So that would cut those costs and numbers down as, as per uh, district if, if nobody offers to, to run against the incumbent or whatever there to, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, Put an election in that district so that may change the numbers as we go forward as well those were my my questions for today is there any, anything that anybody would like to add no i i guess i might just add well i, I would add um that uh our fishermen i believe are still fishing within the areas um the crab and lobster fishermen i know the the, the lobster fishermen are have been having a hard go with the markets and and the and the the costs and the markets their their costs and and I think catches are good but prices are down um, so uh, I can keep I encourage them to keep moving forward and hopefully they'll get the season out of it. There's been a few times where we didn't think it was going to continue and and uh, I just want to let them know that I am out there listening and uh, I think. Uh, I think for the for the most part we're moving forward, but uh, hopefully that continues. You can send us your municipal questions at chne.television at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.